You know, part of what James is talking about, as I began this morning just thinking about too, is our giving. To give faithfully, to give lovingly, to give as we are instructed to give. And thank you for your faithfulness in doing so. Uh, it doesn't just keep up these buildings, it keeps the kingdom going. And it, and it shares uh, God's love to others. You know, we accomplish that by who we are, what we do, what we're about, how we live, uh, the actions that we have. And I've got it up on the screen, it's relevance. It's being relevant. I think that's where James is at. It comes, James comes near the end of, of the Bible, and it's more like a, a get real Christian, <laughs> get purposeful Christian, get, be about your faith Christian, just live it out and, and don't be a hypocrite, be the same person day in, day out, not the same rotten person day in, day out, but a, a righteous person. Be, make your faith mean something and, and how you treat others. You know, remember what Jesus said, love, love me and love one another. So that's important ingredients, of course, into all this. And then be able to respond to that through living out our faith. Uh, authenticity really matters. It's, and it's being relevant. And, and you know, we... He began this recognizing that we have trials and even rejoice in your trials and learn from them and grow through the trials. And then we're, we kind of got stuck on temptations. Maybe I've been tempted to just stay here until we get it. Um, because temptations are the things that open the door to sin, open the door to us living unfaithfully. And so we're going to keep going on that. And then James even continues to open the door and we look at, at uh, next I think chapter 2 is more about favoritism. And to me, favoritism then leads to racism and prejudice and all those things. It's going to then move into what this thing, this rudder within our, our, our mouth, the tongue, and how it so often leads us astray and, and uh, causes harm not just to us, but especially to others. Uh, going to get into o obedience. It's going to get into even testing our patience. Our possessions, all those things are going to come into light. John, uh, he's going to throw a little light on all those as we go through it. So it's just living out our life and being relevant and being authentic. Teresa and I were on a trip uh, about 11 years ago. We went with that group, the pastors that were assembled together. Good trip. We had a good time. We got away. This, this group organization was, was honoring pastors, and, and we got to go to a, a nice... Uh, spot where it was, we had a, a good time together, it was five or six days, and one of the days we were off on this little excursion, and um, you were talking to this lady, I think, weren't you? It was a, we were on a, we were taking, it was a boat ride to go to this place, we were going on a ferry ride to go shopping, that's what it was, and <laughs> it was kind of interesting, but she got just struck up a conversation with this lady, and I'll, I'll count it, she could tell it better than me, but I'll do my best, and she'll correct me if I need to. Uh, it was uh, she said, uh, I believe it's something like this. It was yesterday or the day before. She had done something nice for somebody and, and uh, even bought them something and taken them to dinner. That's right. She'd paid for their dinner. She'd done the day before, she'd taken this couple to dinner and done something nice for them. So today, she was going to go on the she was going on this trop, shopping trip and she was going to buy something nice for herself to reward herself for what she did yesterday. <laughs> What, what was it? God wanted her to do that. That was the other thing. God wanted her to do that. I left out the most important part. Now, is that very authentic? Is that very relevant? Yeah, nice things are nice. Just say, I want to go buy something nice. You know, Don't say, God wants me to go buy something nice. I think God could care less about whether we buy it. He wants us to get good value for our dollar. That's what I always think. But that's, no, that's the Greg Davis theology, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but that just struck both of us. You know, we just kind of shook our head. And are we like, it's a challenge, am I like that? Do I think, I, do I do, do something to enable me to do something else? Am I tempted this way, you know, and reward myself this way? I, you know, we can, we can get pretty messed up at times. And this is a, kind of a, a correcting book in, to help us stay on track and uh, keep ourselves purposefully in line. And James, this is really one verse that sums up so much in the book of James. 
<coughs> excuse me, says, do not merely listen to the word. Don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. But, and because you'll deceive yourself if you do that. Be doers of the word. Do what it says. Nike would say, well, that swoosh, just do it. We recognize that. Do we recognize that about God, that we should just do what it says in his word? Because sometimes when we open that door, that's the title of today's message, don't open that door, that door can allow the outside to enter in or sin to enter in. And the one guy looks like he's paid a price for opening that door. And the verse that shared with us is in small print. I will read to you. It's from Genesis 4-7. This is Cain and Abel. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must master it. In the very beginning, God says, get control of it. Master it. Don't open that door. In fact, walk away from that door. Remember the story of Cain and Abel. Cain had one job. His was to, what, take care of the, the farm, the, the crops and such. And Abel was in charge of the animals. And when they brought their sacrifice into the Lord, Cain brought a sacrifice. But Abel brought the best of his offering. The best of his flock was brought to the Lord. The first of the flock was brought in. And the Lord smiled upon that sacrifice. He loved that sacrifice. That was what, that was pleasing to God. And out of jealousy, Cain was angry about it. Cain could have brought a better sacrifice, but he didn't. And he was jealous of what Abel brought, but more so jealous that God showed favor upon Abel for what he had done. God said, be careful about that. Because sin will enter in, and you know what happened next. Cain took Abel out in the field, and no more Abel. So it overcame him. So we have to be careful about some of those temptations that we have in our life. It's, life, it's, it's there to enter in if we allow it to, if we open that door to it. So let's pray. God, we, uh, we pray you open the door to our mind's eye, to our memory, to our intellect, to our wisdom, to all those things that need to penetrate our, to our very soul. Lord, let, use, make all this matter to me, matter to everyone here this morning, and how we be authentic in our Christian living. Amen. So we're going to track through this again. I know I presented these verses to you last week, and I believe even introduced them the week before, but it's about temptation. James 1, 13 to 15 says, And remember you are being tempted when you are being tempted. Not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from who? Our own desires from us, doesn't it? It's from right in here. Which entice us and drag us away. And we'll speak a little about that this morning. These desires give birth to sinful actions and go through this process, and then when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It's a process that we go down through, and actually I think this reads pretty plainly. And we pray, we prayed it this morning, we prayed many of you daily, Father, let us not get into that temptation. Let us turn our back to it. Let us not open that door. Deliver us from that. Keep us from that. You know, help me, Lord, if that's a better way to put it. Just, just whenever you're tempted to say, help me, Lord. I can't do it alone, okay? So we shouldn't be surprised by temptation as we go through this. Because it says when you are being tempted, which means lumps us all together, which means none of us. And I don't believe even some of you say, well, I've moved beyond that. I'm not tempted anymore. I've, I've graduated to something else. I'm mature now. I don't think so. I think we all still are tempted one way or another in, in so many things in our life. And you could supply most anything. I know you were challenged a couple of weeks ago to think of that one thing that you are struggling with most. Maybe you still are hanging on to that and haven't even got it out in the opening. Is there one thing that's tempting you most that you're having the most difficulty with now and ask God to help you with that? So we move on. Don't be surprised by it. We need to understand that it is universal. 
it is universal. We're all, we're all tempted. Every single one of us. John Wesley used to say, you know, he, he, we go through this process of grace. And I used to say, because I guess it was in the 1700s when he used to say that, but he, his theology of grace goes through the point of God seeks us, he woos us, he begins us to make us aware of, of sin, temptations, all those things to the point where we become saved. He draws us to him and we're justified, we are saved. Then we go through the rest of our life and we're sanctified where we're rooting out that sin. We're beginning to, to learn what it is and we begin to turn our back to it and we begin to live, uh, uh, live according to what even James is saying to us. And to the point where he said you can even reach loving per perfection. So, some of you might have approached that. It's possible, Wesley said, that one could reach. He didn't think he ever could. He had thought if he ever reached that, he'd probably be dead the next moment. So it's possible to continue to be refined, to grow, to, to develop your own faith in such a way that, that uh, you're rooting out this and, and turning your back on temptation all the time. So as we look at this, go back and say, when you are being tempted, sometimes we think this, we think God is picking on me. And sometimes you might need to be picked on. Remember it said in the very beginning also that you're going to suffer some trials. So occasionally trials do come our way. But temptation is not a, a God act. It says, if we go on and look at that, it's from the inner self, our own desires that cause us to be tempted to go astray. So uh, the moment we enter the world, temptation is ever before us. Matthew says to be careful. He told the disciples this whenever they, he went in to pray on the night he was arrested and the night he was betrayed, all the things that happened on that very night before the crucifixion. He told his disciples to watch out and he tells us that as well. So this is one of the, begin to give you some ways to combat the temptation. Stop, watch, look, yield, pray that you will not enter into the temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. In other words, God says, I'm here. We're the weak ones in this equation. <laughs> the flesh is weak. You've probably used that one a time or two, haven't you? You've probably quoted that Bible verse. You're quoting Jesus when you quote that Bible verse. Good job. Keep it up. Okay, so keep alert in everything. So don't be surprised by the temptation. We need to understand it is inevitable. It's going to happen. Today is 24 hours long, the week is seven days a week, the year is 365, and we get an add-on every four years, but those days are inevitable. Temptation is inevitable too. Happens to your pastor, happens to a bishop, it happens to a pope, it happens to everyone. Temptation is inevitable, it's going to happen. You remember temptation even, I shared last week, happened to Jesus. He did not yield to it, he did not give in to it. It was inevitable. <coughs> We need to understand that it is personal. It might be designed directly to hit you right between the eyes. I kind of looked at it this way and I thought about it being personal and temptation to design. You, you know, we, we, have you ever had your computer, many of you still are very active in a computer, have you ever noticed that sometimes things pop up that look like things you have done before or your own desires or maybe a shopping list at some place, maybe you've you bought off of Amazon or uh, something and they'll come back and say, have you looked at this or considered this? You, you looked at the CVS, you had the CVS app up yesterday and it said you'd been there so many times and, and you, you've bought these things in the past. It knows what you have done, it, whatever it is, you know, cyberspace. They know. <laughs> Temptation knows, okay? It's, it's like there's a browser working out there on temptation that knows your very inmost thoughts, your very beings, and, and just wants to grab hold of you. Right? Anybody amen on that? Yeah? So you turn your computer on, you've got to be careful where you go. Yeah. And 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be on guard against that, those temptations. Be vigilant, be sober. 
Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom it may devour. I want to resist that lion. I don't think I can always do it on my own. I may try to do it on my own, but I know I can't do it on my own. Take some time. Stop before you proceed and ask for that help. Whatever it might be. We move on. Who is to blame? The temptation then. Who is to blame? The devil maybe do it. Flip Wilson would say that. Right? And Satan certainly does tempt us. I will give him full credit for that. Full, full, absolute. He can have it. See, we shouldn't tempt others though. That's something that I, I guess I haven't brought into this equation as much too. I think we can, we sometimes can tear down others when we're not authentic and when we're not who we're supposed to be. We, we have to also encourage others and not try to draw them into what we might. Say you want to, uh, you're thinking, I might, I don't think I'm going to go to church Sunday. I'm just using that one. And then you call up your neighbor and say, hey, well, let's go boating Sunday. So everybody goes boating. I think that's, we can draw our neighbors into things too. So, and that's just an easy one if I want to throw one out. So don't be confused by it. There's deception in it. Temptation comes from our own desires, so it comes from within, which entice us and drag us away. They entice us and drag us. And I put that up there. We got a few fishermen. John, if you want to go out and catch the best best fish, you just went on a trip to Maine. You want to you want the best lure you can get, or the best bait, the fattest worm, the, the biggest cricket, the whatever, to go out and catch that that fish that you're trying to catch. You set the, you set the hook, you put the, the bait on it. If you just throw out a bare hook, <laughs> fish isn't gonna bite on that, is it? No. There's things out there that are baited for us, or, or he, actually this, is, this was intentional the way James put it. There was a lot of fishing going on in that particular time, and, and he used the analogy of, of uh, fishing here where you had bait, or a hunter that sets a trap. You put the best of what you can to, to catch that fish or that in the act. And, and those things are there to entice us. They look shiny. That's many of the commercials we get today look shiny and bright and, and such. And, and uh, they're deliberately after us and all those things. And an, uh, the fish will bite more often when you have that nice juicy worm on there, on there and then probably a skinny little worm that you can't recognize. So just be careful with the deception that's out there because it does await us. And these desires then give birth to sinful actions. We can get caught. We can bite on that hook and we can be caught. Just the process as he flows down there. Even though there might be some warning signs along the way. You know, there's warning signs on a lot of foods we eat. We still eat them. I, I occasionally drink a Diet Coke during the day. Now we're being told the warning sign is they're what well, cancer causing. And there's so many things out there like that that they carry a warning sign, a warning sign on those. Uh, I'm, for, I'm, I'm glad now they're saying coffee is not bad for you. So <laughs> at least I, I probably wouldn't listen to that one anyway. But, uh, but, but that's kind of what we can do with some things that we see the harmful signs, the warnings of them, and we don't pay attention. Now, these are ones that I tend to pay attention to, warning signs of my car. They come up on my dashboard. I hate it when I see that check engine light come on my car or the low tire. Matt's got on his car right now. It's got a check engine light and a low tire warning. I can't get rid of either one of them. I've tried. I took it to, to a dealership and he thought, don't worry about it. I don't like to see those. There's a lot of warning signs out there on these things. We, and uh, we should be as reactive to those warning signs when we see them on a car as we are warning signs when we see them on our daily life. When there's a warning sign, there's a curve ahead, you better be careful. There's a curve ahead. These people coming around this curve right here go way too fast. And they need to be cautious on, on how fast they drive. And it's, our life can get out of control too if we're not careful of some of the warning signs that we see. And we're tempted to continue to go down that path. See, James has given us practical living, practical ways to live. Leads to disobedience once we get into that birth to sinful actions. We get caught up in it. We get trapped. We can't get beyond it. We're stuck. We're stuck. 
in that. He keeps going down through that. And so how do we begin to work our way out of this? And I don't want to leave us in this stuck manner because the next verse gets even worse. Before we get further into that, I love, you know how much I love the book of Philippians. And chapter 2 says, you've got to work at it. It's one of my, always my big reminders. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your salvation. That's that point where John Wesley was talking about in sanctification. You've got to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. You've got to begin to work at it. Ask for help. Ask others to help you. To hold you accountable. Accountability groups are good. Uh, a friend is good in these cases. Work out your salvation. The Lord is the most important one to lead you. You do it with some fear and trembling. I think that's where God's acknowledging it's not easy. I know it's not easy. Do it with fear and trembling. For I'm working with you. I am there. For a good purpose. Then that, doesn't that start to make meaning that God said, hey, I'll, I'll help fill that void. I'll be there in the midst of all that mess that is going on in your life or in the world that you're living. I attest to that. For if you don't, heading down that trap continue to result in death. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It leads us down to that trap. Now, not particularly talking about a physical death. He's talking about a death that if you spiral, continue to go down that spiritually, your relationship with God can, can end. And he, remember, the book of James is written to Christians. He's giving the warning here that it can rob you of that salvation. It can take you and turn you away. Because sin is that dangerous in each of us, if allowed to grow and to not change. Ultimately, ultimately, it leads to death. We know from Romans and the pathway to salvation that for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift is God's Son, Jesus Christ. Church, that's where we turn to. That's who we turn to. That's how we turn turning away from this. For there is one with us who is then desires to restore the joy of your salvation. So whenever, say, you've been there, done that, want to recover, want to, to be apart from that, God will restore joy in your life, peace in your life, a willing spirit, a loving spirit. He is there to help. So we have to choose. We're going to end the temptation message this morning. We're going to go forth with some other things that James wants to now begin to build us up and to help us with, but we have to choose him. Remember, Joseph chose the way of escape or choose the way of Satan. So I challenge, ask, plead, turn to God in your times of need. Turn to him. I love, I love to go back and remind you of this verse once again. Work it out. Seek someone to help you. He was willing and desires to work within each of you. Gracious and loving God, we know temptation is always with us. We know sin is, we're born into sin and we're born with uh, the tendency to sin. Lord, uh, as this verse says, work in us, through us, and use us, Lord, to get control, to have control, and let you have control within our very lives. As we continue to go forth, might we do so mindful of all this? Trusting in you and being faithful in our daily living. I pray through Christ. Amen.